Living without automobiles, electricity, or many of the modern conveniences most Americans take for granted, one might expect the Amish, like so many past utopian societies, to soon disappear. They've actually survived and thrived and prospered because they have reacted to change by changing themselves. Numbering only about 5,000 in 1900, by the year 2011, they numbered over 260,000 souls in 28 states and one Canadian province. Their population doubles every 20 years. Yes, our system works. We have a lot going for us. We know it works. Amish faith and life are deeply rooted in the Bible. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's very important to be careful what you read, what you watch, what you listen to. An Amish German school teacher and businessman describes what it means to be Amish. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. They're absolute building blocks that nobody can get around. And that's why we do the things we do and keep on doing the things we do. There are some people that look at the Amish and they romanticize the lifestyle. Well, if that's all there is to it, it probably won't hold. Because you can move to Alabama and be a hippie and, and live like we do. That's not what we're about. What we are trying to follow is basically the patterns that were set by our Anabaptist forefathers in certain areas there, in dress uh, and, and in lifestyle. If you keep doing some of these things and you adhere to the standards and the, and the things that they teach, they will help you to create the absence of temptation in your Christian life. We know that uh, we are sinners. We know that we have to be born again. We know that we have to accept Jesus as our Savior. Concerned about what he saw as spiritual decline among Anabaptists, Jacob Amon in 1693 called for a strict excommunication or shunning of wayward church members. Followers of Amon came to be called Amish. By resisting change in dress as well as in technological acceptance in the new world, the Old Order Amish emerged as the distinctive or plain people with a way of life that ran counter or at least far behind the culture around them. Loosely organized into some 1900 church districts, more than 450 are located in Ohio. Families in church districts take turns hosting the service in their homes. A specially designed wagon transports benches and songbooks from house to house. The congregation assembles for a service of singing, praying, and preaching that often lasts three hours. The Amish songbook, known as the Ausbun, was first published in 1564. Sung slowly, the songs are passed from generation to generation. Melodies are embellished in ways that make them all but unrecognizable to outsiders. Preachers are determined by the casting of lots. When the lot falls on an individual, he is called to God's service for life. I'm a minister, oh well, I'm really ordained as a bishop. I'm the leader of a church group. It is a bigger jump from minister to bishop than it was from a member to a, to a minister. If it wouldn't be for the Lord's help, I could not do this at all. Marriage, communion, breaking bread and wine, and, and the uh, baptism is the bishop's duties. Despite what appears to be a strict similarity between the Amish, they are really quite diverse in their practices. In Ohio alone, there are at least a dozen different types of Amish. Each church district decides on its own organum or rules by which its members live. Such rules discourage waywardness. Every six months the ministers come together and they simply talk about issues and they have a certain core of standards that basically everybody 
upholds. It's unwritten. If you have a hundred bishops and they they don't all look alike on certain bylaws and when we try to do as close as we can, not 100%. You can see that. Around the core, fringe issues arise. These issues often relate to technological acceptance. How any church group decides these issues may well be determined by the survival needs of its own members. They're very connected, not only to each other, but to society. Uh, they know what is necessary uh, to do to survive economically. A generation ago, Amish farmers began to respond to changing agricultural economics by increasing the size of their farms. This meant also increasing the number of horses the average farmer needed to work his farm. More horses demanded more hay be planted, cut, and stored, resulting in more work than hand labor would allow. To keep their farms viable, some Amish came to accept hay balers powered by gasoline engines. But even with this decision, difficulties arose. Some church districts decided that balers should remain stationary. Later, other church districts decided that tractors fitted with steel wheels, thereby limiting them to field use and not road use, was an acceptable compromise with technology. When falling commodity prices and increasing governmental regulation threatened the Amish farm, survival dictated that the church begin to look for additional ways for their families to increase their incomes. Our Amish farmers cannot compete in conventional agriculture. Forty years ago, here in the community, we were 90 to 95 percent farmers. Today, we're at less than 10 percent. It is making an impact. Some is positive, some is negative. There is only so much farmland available, it's not something that we can make. And we are ourselves part of the problem because there's more of us for the same amount of land. And there's also development pressure from the outside. Land is too expensive to buy, purchase, and pay for farming. So we still have to eat and clothe ourselves and live somewhere. So we look to other places for occupation. The next best thing to being a farmer is having a small cottage business where you work and create things and, and you still have to work. Change comes about out of necessary economic survival mode. It varies a great deal. As agricultural income declined, the Amish looked elsewhere for jobs, close to home, that would not compromise their values. 30 or 40 years ago, we had hardly any tourists in the area. Now we have about 3 million a year. A lot of the non-Amish businesses in the area uh, are tourist related. They employ the Amish. Uh, the Amish are very good workers in the restaurants. They work in the kitchen, the bakery, waitresses hostesses, etc. While some Amish were finding employment in non-Amish enterprises, others were starting their own businesses. Many tourists come to this area to buy Amish furniture and all kinds of wood products that they produce. And so I think they become actually quite dependent on the tourists. They were forced into some other means of providing for themselves ra rather than going and working for someone else. And so with a lot of skilled labor and making furniture, they just started on their own. And because a couple of them started them successful, it just kind of had that domino effect. Men and women alike find employment in an industry that markets solid wood furniture across the nation 